Hello everybody, welcome to today's episode of Elusive Archives. I'm currently at the cemetery, uh, having a good old time. I thought that I would film here, I've been wanting to film here actually. I came here yesterday, on the Saturday, and it was a beautiful, beautiful day. I brought my little blanket that I love to sit outside on, and I brought my journal, a book, and was just relaxing, hanging out by this little pond in this cute little area, and then some geese were coming up to me hanging out, and I felt really spiritually connected to them. So I have a couple different topics in front of me right now, I'm not exactly sure what all I'm going to dive into. I may just jump around a bunch. It may just be a rambly situation, but really, really cute spot right here. I'm currently sitting next to the grave of a woman named Lorraine Grubbs, and I think there's another name on here too, but I don't know if I'm going to say like her full name, so we'll just say that. And then there's two little pictures of dogs on it, so I wonder if they're buried with her. I feel like that'd be a pretty fair assumption. So we've got Libby, and then we've got Charlie with two E's. I felt really drawn to this area in particular. It reminds me of Savannah, Georgia, and I grew up in Georgia. I think I've only been to Savannah maybe once or twice, but... I have such vivid memories of going there, and we did a ghost tour at night, which was so fun, and I was so drawn to that energy. I feel like that's one thing my family did do right (laughs) back in the day, was we would go to trips like that occasionally, and and something like the Biltmore, I think that's in North Carolina, and it felt kind of haunted, spooky, cool, really neat architecture, very cool vibe, and that was such a good memory and we would go to different forts and historical battle sites like in Jacksonville and just little base camps and we would see like a navy ship like the American U.S. Navy (laughs) like we would go tour places like that or like aircraft places and things like that so I've always had that influence in my life and one of the things that we did was go to Savannah, Georgia, and there was an aspect of spiritualism and hauntedness and all the goods. I really enjoyed it a lot. So I picked this spot today because the trees kind of reminded me of Savannah and I was feeling that vibe. And I'm sitting by a tree that I've never seen one like this in this entire cemetery. I've driven through here a lot, and I've walked around, not necessarily walked around, like, I'll usually, like, pick a spot and just kind of, like, explore a little area, and then I'll drive to a different one, so I haven't, like, fully walked the grounds, but still, I haven't seen this kind of tree, so I'll I'll explain it to you. (laughs) Maybe I can show you. It's a video, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll show you. Okay, here's where we're at. Got my stuff set up, and then this is the tree that I'm talking about. So it's got some plants around it and some vines going up it, and I don't know if you can tell from this angle or not, but there's a stump. It looks like one of the huge branches of this tree must have been annihilated at one point and needed to be, like, sawed off clean, it looks like, to me. Not really sure the reasoning behind all of that, but beautiful tree. And I've never sat in this particular spot before, so it's kind of fun. Okay, let's look at our topics. So I'll just go ahead and read this to you all. I ended up taking some Polaroid pictures, which I really like to do whenever I come here, is to just explore, take pictures of things that stick out to me and resonate with me, and just to kind of document my trip of the day to the cemetery, I guess. So I was sitting in this area, I talked a little bit about it maybe in this podcast like a few minutes ago, but it was like, imagine ground level, the area that people drive their cars on, most of the cemetery, I mean it's a hills, there's, you know, it's not like completely flat, but this is the most like deep 
low part of the whole cemetery, I feel. It's like right whenever you drive in, there's this little area, there's a bench. I took pictures of it. Hold on, here you go. If you're watching visually on YouTube, there's a bench around this tree and some tulips. And then right on the other side of that, there's this dip. And side note, I went to the University of Kentucky, and if you're familiar with that, which is probably very niche, but some of you may know, there's a place that we would call the Bowl, and it's a place that people would like tailgate in and stuff like that, but um, it reminded me of the Bowl a little bit, to some extent. Anyways, so I walked down there, and it was so steep to the point where it's like, am I gonna break my ankles? Am I okay? Like, can I, can I walk down this hill? It was a it was a little bit of a challenge but I did it <laughs> so I sat down there got my little blanket out and was just relaxing just watching these two geese that were there just calmly observing their behavior and just watching them eat the little grass and one was standing on one leg and the other one was just munching real good on that grass and they both had I feel like they had different personalities like one was way more shy and reserved and the other was a lot more bold and courageous and more like silly goofy I guess you could say okay helicopter or military plane it's a helicopter Well wishes and good riddance to whoever's in that helicopter. I'm not quite sure. So, yeah, I was just relaxing, watching their behavior, and just taking in nature without my phone, without writing something, without drawing, like just kind of taking a good like hour just in the air, just being calm. And it was so relaxing, and I was like feeling like I was literally becoming a goose. <laughs> I was like sitting there, I'm like wow, I'm just living their life right now. <laughs> I feel like I get like that. Like I can kind of, if I'm like watching something close enough, I feel like I almost am like influenced by it and can spiritually become it. Just just in terms of gaining its perspective and where it's coming from. But I, I also saw a woodpecker and it was the one with like the red on its head, little red feathers and the black wings with the white little lines on it. I grew up seeing those in Georgia. There's a certain tree that all the woodpeckers would go crazy over. And then I saw this other animal crawling around. I don't know what it was. I was like, what is that? Don't think it's a rabbit. It kind of could have been a either a gopher or a groundhog. I'm kind of leaning towards groundhog, but like do groundhogs like come out i know that sounds stupid but i know they come out to tell us the weather whenever it's spring forward and all that shit i don't know you know what? strike that <laughs> um yeah so i saw that little creature and i was like oh my god like i just feel so blessed i'm just sitting in the middle and there's two geese there's a woodpecker there's crows there's a gopher groundhog whatever the fuck you were chilling and there's little butterflies and little ants everywhere and I just felt very connected to nature and so at peace. Do y'all hear the trees and the breeze? Oh, it's so beautiful and calm. I could literally like cry. Not, not really right now, but I love, love, love an overcast day, like, okay, bird, like, life is beautiful, y'all, I'm sorry, I said it, <laughs> anyways, I will read you all these different topics that I have and maybe I'll end up splitting it into a couple of episodes and maybe this won't necessarily be like like my other episodes in terms of content and how it just is one topic and a more condensed concept it might just be like I said more of a rambly and I, I might 
title this something in particular if I want to start making this more of a regular thing to come to the cemetery and just relax and chat and like free flow it essentially but I have this notebook it's my art journal so I have some things in that and I also have this little I think it's called LCD I don't know if it's LED yeah LCD writing tablet if you guys are familiar I think this is from five and below I hijacked it from the shelter whenever I worked there from the kids department sue me I just really wanted one okay <laughs> So, the topics on here I'll just read through, so maybe y'all can just like see my brain today in the past couple weeks or whatever, but actually I think I did this the other day. So, the title of this one was Female Yearning, Pain, and Rage. Now, surface level, outside looking in, I don't know that I love this concept because it almost reinforces the idea of women are crazy. It's a man's world. Women are crazy. Women are insane. We don't believe women. Like, all that shit, right? And the whole feminism and everything like that. I'm not, like, deeply schooled and deeply coursed in the world of feminism. So, I'll preface with that. However, on the other hand, on the big hand, <laughs> a lot of these themes are very, very relatable. Oh, my God. <gasps> Is there a bee in my hair? There's either a bee in my hair, a fly in my hair. Something just happened to me. <laughs> I'm okay, I'm okay. A lot of these themes are very relatable. We'll say that. Very much. So, maybe I'll read through these and then we'll just dissect a little bit of some of them. Languish. Lament. Melancholy. Melodramatic. Yearning. Pain. Anguish. Rage. Uncontrollable rage. Psychosis. Psychotic schizophrenia, terror, stricken with terror, dissociation, mourning, loss, void, damsel, maiden, escapism, pensive, and daydream. Now, the visual world that I'm kind of thinking about in terms of this is a abandoned psych ward <laughs> i'm very into watching either like maybe you could call them urban exploring videos or paranormal videos ghost hunting whatever you want to call it i get into different different creators and things but i do have my like core favorites but there's a place that people go to occasionally these people that like to explore these places and they'll go to asylums haunted asylums, empty asylums, whatever. And for some reason, I just feel very drawn to that environment. And I'm like, it's probably because I got my own set of psychiatric things going on, I'm sure, is why I'm interested in that. But I think, you know, just human baseline in general, I think all of us are very curious about topics that are not as mainstream or common or acceptable. And that, that, I would say, is in alignment with the whole, like, dark arts stuff, taxidermy, um, haunted things, possession, uh, voodoo, like, all that stuff. It's not, like, a common mainstream thing that, like, is universal to everybody. There's just certain people that are more drawn to it than others, and that's kind of more their world. But it's not, like I said, universal. But I'm kind of arguing here that... I think the whole female yearning pain and rage is very in alignment with the whole psychiatric stuff and the whole being put in a psych ward. And I actually just got done reading The Bell Jar, I think it was a week or two ago, and that book is based on uh, the author Sylvia Plath, or Plath, Plath, I think she ended up committing suicide, but she... I don't know if she went to a psych ward, but her character definitely did. So I was like mentally in that world of her as well. But back in the day, they would put women in psych wards for melancholy. They would see that as like an issue. Also, side note, these podcasts are not very... Like, I don't really do historical research or do anything in depth for these kinds of things. I just maybe might look up a definition here and there or, like, 
something you know so it's like don't come at me from that perspective but I'm just kind of like spiritually talking about the themes and the feelings and artistic symbols and things associated with it but so I'm not a fucking scientist I'm not a fucking psychiatrist or anything like that so just saying but I'm pretty sure that these women would be put in these psych wards for being dramatic and for being depressed and it might just be common depression but they might be put in a whole damn psych ward for it and I guess where I'm trying to come out with this is like back in the day it's almost like those conditions were catered to and it was almost expected for women to like be that way and have those kinds of reactions um and they would just be thrown in a psych ward but today it's just like women just aren't respected and women just aren't like heard or listened to and I feel like a lot of our trauma come it stems from that is not feeling heard not feeling seen not feeling appreciated not feeling understood and you can't feel understood if you're not seen and uh, there's a lot of sadness as a woman there's a lot of loneliness as a woman and doing everything by yourself like you're forced into independence you're forced into taking care of yourself whether or not you want to you just have to (laughs) that's just how it is and of course there's codependencies and attachments and things like that and I feel like a lot of times women or people in general end up being in relationships that aren't healthy for them and that aren't good for them just out of the basis of not wanting to face loneliness and I get that and I've been there before but I definitely am more content being alone now and I like my alone time I've I've honestly loved my alone time like historically genuinely um but there's always that sense of yearning, that emptiness that does come up. It's just like a deep-rooted thing. I don't know. I just feel like it's like a storyline that I've identified with for so long and that's been my identity, I feel. And I think I've talked about this before and some people in my life know about this too, is that I feel like I have very widow energy, like just historically taking care of myself um like I don't know how to explain that widow just in pain all the time just just feeling like there's some void there's like something that is more out there I know there's more out there for me but I'm just like not tapped into it like I feel like I kind of have identified with that and and honestly more than anything just the feeling of loss losing everybody and see it makes me sound like a stereotype but it's like everybody that I've ever been close to has left has died has gone away and that's where I feel like that widow energy comes into um, comes into play a little bit it's just like chronic loss chronic pain chronic lamenting which is I actually looked up definitions for some of this stuff but lament is to mourn and it's a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. I, I think that's beautiful. I don't know. Passionate expression of grief or sorrow. It, it's almost like an art form in a way to mourn so deeply and to care so deeply to the point where it's like all consuming and that it takes over your psyche. And it's like a big thing you focus on is your pain. And this is a dangerous game because you can get addicted to that that pain and you often are addicted to it. And it's your identity, it's who you are, it's your pain. So I kind of want to like stop there and not flip into the other topics that I already have on here, which is about, you know, addictions to pain, addictions to pattern, things like that. Like that's a whole other thing and I have an episode on that, so I don't want to like deeply dive into that here. But... looking at life through the lens of grief and sorrow and loss can bite back and it can make things more difficult whenever you actually do want happiness and you do want something in your life because you are constantly aware of the fact that things slip away that things leave that things go away that people die that situations change and that things never stay the same it's like a universal truth that you are you're on the same page as yourself with that you understand that so deeply and intimately so whenever you want something good in your life 
you walk into it knowing, well, this isn't going to last forever. This is going to go away. So you're like, I don't know if the words are setting it up for failure, but I don't know that that's the most healthy way to approach something. And then I'll like caveat that with attachment issues can follow if you're going into it with that because it's almost like it's so precious because you're so aware of loss that you like don't want it to go away even more so then you do get a little bit of an attachment or you're on the other end of it to the point where you know it's going to go away so you don't let yourself get attached you don't allow for attachment and for roots and things to be intertwined and formed into whatever it is because you know it's going to go away anyways and is that a not hopeful way to live is that a sad way to live is that a limiting way to live because you're not ever really allowing it to enter your frequency and you're not really allowing it to intertwine with you and maybe it could become a root of some kind and it's very important to you like are you always going to push that away just because you know it's going to end that's a whole I guess thought process or the other end might be the more hopeful end but it also causes a lot of pain is wow look at this blessing look at how beautiful this is how sacred this is to me I feel it in my bones that this is sacred I know things don't last forever I get that but this is something so beautiful that I want to allow it to enter my life and I want to have a healthy relationship with this person, this energy, this situation, this season in my life. I want to feel healthy and good about this. I don't want to put up those walls. I don't want to decline it. I don't want to shove it away because I'm scared of getting attached to it. See, as I say that word, I almost get frustrated about it with myself because I'm like, attachment is bad, attachment is bad. It really is. I'm sorry, it really is. And if we want to go like all Buddhist on it, like attachment is the cause of all suffering. Is that how it goes? Attachment is the root cause of all suffering. It really is. Okay. Let's look at our list and see if we can kind of get back on a track. I would say if you're a person that is sensitive with attachments and you fear them or you fear getting close to somebody or you fear letting your walls down, that kind of thing, I feel like you're the type of person that does a lot of daydreaming and thinking and you spend a lot of time in your inner world being intellectually creative and spiritually creative from a distance and removed from the person, the situation, the whatever it is. Because you know the pains associated with it. So let's let the plane pass. So you know the pains associated with it. So the safer way to interact with it is to daydream about it period amen absolute love (laughs) i know this all too well if you're daydreaming about it you can't get hurt you know why you can't get hurt because it's a fantasy and it's made up and it's in your head no one can hurt you if you're just in your head But then the challenge comes whenever you try to translate the daydream world into the real physical plane. And if those images don't match up, it's, it can be alarming, it can be off-putting, it can be discouraging, it can be disappointing, it can be deeply painful whenever your daydreams don't match your physical reality. So I find, for me... It's hard to be a person. (laughs) It's hard to be a person. 
because I love a good daydream. I love a good fantasy world. I love thinking of how good something can be. Um, And I think our daydreams actually do reflect reality to some extent. And it's also maybe a form of manifesting is to like visualize a reality. And as you get to know yourself, I know this is a side tangent, but as you get to know yourself more and more and you spend more time daydreaming and visualizing and then you start to like do physical actions and you take physical action and motion towards something that is more in alignment with these daydreams, it feels a little bit better and a little bit more balanced because you're working towards actualizing them. But if you're just daydreaming and just fantasizing, it's a little bit of a trap because you're not actually able to translate that into something that you can experience for yourself in your actual world. So I think that creates a lot of like detachment from self in terms of I feel so myself in my fantasy world, but in my physical world, I don't feel like myself. That that point is where I would say a lot of the struggle comes from and, and a lot of the pain comes from. So that's also something I feel like I'm actively starting to be aware of and perceive a little bit more. Melancholy. I wrote this poem. Oh, I really wish I had it in front of me right now. It's on my phone, obviously, but I'm filming on it. But um, it's a very beautiful piece. And maybe I'll like attach it and like put it in here, potentially. Um, but if not, I'll just try my best to summarize it. So, essentially, it's a poem about this girl personified, and her name is Melancholy, and she is so beautiful. She's flowy, gorgeous goddess, like, but not, not like an unattainable goddess. I actually take that back. She's just like a real human, and she's so good at being a human and she's so beautiful and graceful and light and it's like she doesn't even experience pain she doesn't even have any bad feelings anything like that she's just like so good and she's living her life but then the contrast of it is the dark side which is like the side that i would identify with more often and it's saying like melancholy in my cellar so like melancholy is living her life in this garden and in this beautiful oceanic um like uh, Italian Parisian like cottagey type of world it's very coastal and beautiful and light and bright but then the contrast of it is the cellar it's the dark place it's the place that's old rotten dusted it has history um, it's it's a place that oh there's a person parking please don't park right here <laughs> it's just the contrast it's like she doesn't even need to know about this cellar like she is so beautiful and so pure in her own way that i don't want her to know how this feels so that is melancholy (laughs) i guess that kind of explains that um i would just say my definition of melancholy or how i'm kind of wanting to describe that visually is that it's just dreaming of something that you know in your heart that maybe i'll never have that's melancholy to me and I've said this before as well but um like being a sunshiny yellow person I don't know that that's in me so it's almost like I'm daydreaming about a life that maybe will not be in my reach and then coming to terms with that and like am I okay with that and then that also creates sadness so that's another feeling um yearning another topic emptiness loss void yearning yearning is a state of i would say also daydreaming you're searching for something outside of yourself that is not in your physical reality it's out of reach you're yearning for it you're wanting for it so badly and the the devilish bite in the fucking back (laughs) about yearning is that yearning pushes it away like whatever you want yearning for it is gonna make it run the other direction so it's like you're you're damned if you have yearning really i think there's a healthy amount of like 
working towards something that you can do like if you yearn or you're wanting something you can work for it but if it becomes your whole identity to like get that thing get that job get that person get that life make and produce this result the yearning for it it gives you this more of a toxic relationship to that thing on the other end that thing you're actually yearning for because first of all if you were to even get it if you're having panic stress and anxiety the whole way there and then you finally get that thing are you really going to be all that glad that you have it i think there's a degree of like self-soothing that you need to do and there's a degree of groundedness that you need to do whenever you're realizing that hey i'm yearning for something right now what can i do in my reality right now to make this sense of yearn lower and less because that's not a healthy energy to have especially long term it's okay to feel that way for sure and like i you know have experienced plenty of seasons of yearning but it's not something that's healthy and sustainable i guess is my point rage i f- oh y'all i feel like this could literally be like an hour long episode maybe it will be we'll just see rage uncontrollable rage what i get with this is when you're used to things not working in your favor and when you feel like you're so far removed from that one thing or this stuff that you want out of your life and it just doesn't seem to be happening even if you're putting in work and you're still not seeing results you get frustrated you get bitter and that rage builds up because oh is there a there's a woodpecker up there the rage comes from a place of feeling like things are unjust that you believe that you're deserved or owed some due justice and that justice never comes melancholy comes up rage comes up abandonment comes up neglect comes up because you're like what kind of world is this where things are not happening for me still (laughs) that's kind of where I'm coming up from that rage also I mean rage is so universal though it's it really could be anything it could be you trying to advocate for something that's very important to you and it just still isn't working even the advocacy isn't working all that passion all that effort that you're putting into something and it's still not producing a result it's going to create some rage it's going to create some frustration some anger i will say though rage is like the longer term word the more chronic word i would say it starts out as feeling misunderstood, feeling not seen, overlooked, underappreciated, all of those things, then you start to get more frustrated. The frustration kicks up. Then it might turn into anger. Then it might turn into rage or disgust, just extreme upset. And then that makes us, what, psychotic? Question mark? Just because we feel so underappreciated, so underseen, so undervalued, so lost, so looked over on purpose, it just feels that way at times. It does create that feeling. Do y'all hear the woodpecker? Another topic probably will end up making more videos on this stuff because I feel like we could really dive into this like thematically and everything but today's I guess just more of an overview but the idea of (laughs) hot take schizophrenia sounds kind of (laughs) nice I'm so sorry I know that's very insensitive very 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 insensitive I apologize um but as a theme schizophrenia is the inability inability to think feel and behave clearly and you're out of touch with reality. Tell me why that sounds kind of nice. Tell me why it sounds like a vacation. <laughs> I was just saying this to my coworkers the other day. I was like, can we all, like, just collectively go to a psych ward? Like, can we all put each other on 72-hour holds, like, just for fun? Like, just to switch it up? Because just having someone else take care of you for a little bit 
all your needs could be nice just put it out there i'm just saying inability to think feel and behave clearly very scary ew is it so bug in my mouth or hair it was hair hair in my mouth okay anyways inability to think feel and behave clearly is very scary very dangerous i would imagine and again I'm, i haven't done research on anything i'm not a psychologist i don't know shit and i don't have anyone in my life that actively has this condition but i would assume it's very dangerous like a schizophrenic person i would assume would get themselves into trouble get themselves hurt hurt other people potentially um, because you can't see clearly you are unable to be in touch with reality and your surroundings around you that is scary i will say so no jokes there like a very serious condition um and then along those lines as well i have the words psychosis and psychotic on here whenever people have a psychotic break and i worked in a domestic violence shelter and i feel like i witnessed some of these and i witnessed some people on the verge of psychotic breaks so this i can speak on a little bit but there is almost a from the outside looking in there almost seems to be a freedom in getting to that point because it's like your psyche is so fucked at the moment and you are so out of touch with like normalcy and like reality that you are in a whole nother world so no matter who talks to you no matter who tries to intervene you are almost like a danger because you are so not here you know um so very scary yes but then the devil's advocate side of it is like that seems kind of freeing to get to that point because you don't even have a you don't have stress you don't have concerns for yourself anymore because your condition is just taking over this break is just popping off and it's happening and it's just all you can do is ride it out or be sedated or be medicated and be taken care of like there's obviously ways to handle these things like medically which i can't speak on um, but just like from a spiritual level, I'm like, dang, that sounds kind of nice. But that's like the fucked up mental health side of me that I'm like, no, like I know logically that that's not a good thing and it's not a great situation to be in. Um, but I will say outside looking in and retrospectively having panic attacks, having, um, just severe episodes where you are so emotionally in it it's only okay looking back that's all i'm gonna say because in the moment these things our brains are so freaking powerful that it makes reality seem like this thought or this cycle or this pattern in your brain right now is actual reality it is actually happening extreme danger extreme truth it's right in front of you it's happening right now so it feels it brings upon all those feelings all the freak outs all the whatever but looking back after, I go, that's actually pretty freeing that I was able to cry as deeply as I did. That was freeing to have that jittery anxiety, that um, the panic, the part where I couldn't breathe, the part where my hands feel numb. It's like, again, this is a very hot take, but and no one has to agree with me literally at all. But it's almost beautiful that our bodies have systems and have um, ways that it tries to cope um, and it's also kind of beautiful that like these things even can happen to us like the fact that we can have a panic attack for some reason is interesting to me the fact that our nervous system genuinely makes us change our behaviors and how we are um, and like our ability or inability to regulate our nervous system is for some reason very intriguing to me and I find it just beautiful that us humans get to have these feelings and experience these things. But while you're in the middle of it, it is not a good time at all. Any stretch of the imagination. Zero percent fun. Just saying. But I'm saying to reach those depths of the human emotion and psyche is interesting to me. That's it. And then maybe the last thing I'll talk about in here and then we'll cut out for the day is dissociation and i watched split last night i haven't seen split in like years since it came out but um one of my coworkers told me that it was on netflix and i was like oh fuck yeah that's what i'm doing this weekend <laughs> watching split so i did
And that is something that I find so incredibly intriguing, uh, the whole dissociative identity disorder, DID, commonly known as, and the fact that you can have multiple personalities um, or protectors of your your core, who you are, um, that these identities arise to protect that entity, yourself. Such a very, very intriguing phenomenon to me that that's even a thing. Like, holy shit, that's insane that you can have your own body, your human 3D body, create mental, intangible personalities and um, identity I'm not even I don't know if personalities is the best way of describing it but identities that these identities are formed in your brain whenever a trauma happens or something like that happens to protect you wow wow literally all I can say um on the lighter note of it and maybe the more commonplace reality that some of us experience at times though is dissociating dissociating is also a way of protecting us for me i find i dissociate whenever i'm overwhelmed especially in a public setting a social setting i feel like i do a good bit of dissociating or if it's too much stimulus is going on around me too many sounds too many people talking whatever so a good example would be like a cafeteria growing up lunchroom at school dissociate up the wall in those <laughs> Um, dissociating at work in the domestic violence shelter whenever women are popping off and there's just too much drama and stuff is going on I just kind of sit there and dissociate a little bit but to me again not a doctor not a psychologist whatever but dissociating to me is a form of daydreaming and escapism I feel like I keep saying these things like I'm like having a question inflection in them but dissociating to me seems like a form of escapism and you're trying to control the uncontrollable by entering and by going into another reality than this one. So if you are feeling extremely out of control, you're not in control. You don't know how to make yourself feel better. You don't know what to do. You're almost stunned. You're so overwhelmed. There's so much stimulus. Whatever it is that makes you get in that space where you need to escape your goal your like subconscious goal is to find a way to feel better and to find a way to regulate your nervous system and be okay baseline i'm just trying to be okay i'm gonna escape to do that that's gonna be my technique is to escape so then i'm gonna daydream i'm gonna go somewhere else i'm gonna take myself somewhere else i'm gonna try to remove myself from this situation so that i don't have to be present with it it's a protection. It's a tactic that our body has come up with to help us. I can't speak on whether or not this is healthy or not because I don't know. Um, I think if you're solely living in a world of escapism, it's probably not the best. But at the same time, I think it is a beautiful mechanism that our body instilled or created within us. Like that ability or capacity to dissociate that is, like I have said, kind of beautiful in its own way. So, I think that might be it for today. I feel like I kind of went through those topics at a pretty good pace. Um, yeah. So, I think that's going to be it for today. Thank you all so much for listening and relaxing with me, and thank you so much to Miss Lorraine Grubbs and her cemetery, her little area over here by this beautiful tree. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Thank you to the dog Libby. Thank you to the dog Charlie for being here with us today, and thank you for the Grubbs family in general for being here today since we're in their plot right now. Um, so, yeah. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you all. I hope that you found this interesting, insightful, or thought-provoking, or whatever you want it to be. I love you all. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Talk to you all soon. Bye.